Jason Peacock here with a review of Panasaurus's latest offering, Dinosaur Island, designed by Jonathan Gilmore and Brian Lewis. This is a worker placement game where players are competing to have the greatest dinosaur theme park. They're going to use DNA to create new breeds of dinosaurs. They're going to have rides and food in their, in their park. And you've got to keep the security up to snuff to stop the dinosaurs from escaping and eating your customer base. The first phase is one of the worker placement phases. Every player is going to have these three scientists. Number one scientist, number two, number three, who's like the chief scientist. Now on this science board here, you can do one of four different actions. You can claim a dice, any dice, whatever number of scientists you put there is how many of the benefit you're going to get. These are all different types of DNA. Um, on your player board, you're simply going to move up your quantities of DNA. Anything with a black border is the advanced DNA, and everything with a white border is common DNA. Obviously, the advanced DNA is way rare. The next thing you can, you can do, these will all be face up, is get a dinosaur recipe. You've got to have your number three scientist to get the large carnivores, your number two or greater to get the small carnivores, and any scientist can grab a herbivore. Another thing you can do is raise your limits of DNA. Over here on your player board, the black cubes show you the maximum amount of DNA you can hold. If you do that action, you can raise up um, as many, any combination as the number of scientists you put there. So if I put a number three scientist in there, I can raise three different things up one, one thing up two. It could be basic or advanced. And the fourth thing you can do is put your scientist there and basically pass that scientist and then he will become a worker for you to use during the main worker placement phase. Going on to phase two, we are going to have the market phase. Players will have the option to buy either amusements, lab upgrades, and specialists. Every player is going to get two actions on the market phase, starting with the first player. A player can do any of these four actions printed on the board, um, two, three, four, and five dollars. Uh, raise two of your basic DNA, raise three of your basic DNA, raise one of your advanced DNA, and raise two. When you do any of these basic actions on your market board, you have to take one of these either specialist and attraction, and then discard it. So if I spent three gold and I can increase three of my basic DNA, I'll pick something in this row and discard, and then another player cannot draw that. You can also choose to buy these upgrades, which would upgrade your two starting um, special uh, actions. These can't be replaced by other lab upgrades, just upgraded to either uh, Dinosaur Research 2, and DNA refinement too. I'll explain a little bit those in the uh, phase three. You can buy an amusement. There's a price in gold at the bottom of the cards. Now at the start of the game, they go most expensive on up. So it's going to be the price of your row plus the number on the card. So this one here that costs nine plus five, this would be 14 to put this into my park. Lab upgrades will just cost whatever is in the row. This one will cost five, this one would cost three. And finally, you can buy special this same way. This one is two and this one is five. This is the main way you add other workers into your, uh, your worker pool. You've got eight total, four you start the game with. You can have up to three of these specialists. Once everyone's done two actions, um, one of those things you do could be passing, in which case you would collect $2 from the bank. Then everybody moves on to their worker placement phase, phase three. Everybody's got their own little board here. You've got four starting action that you can place your scientist. The number of slots is how many workers you can put there. So this DNA refinement one, I can put it there and you can make advanced DNA for 
two basic DNA, basically. If I wanted to make this green, it's going to cost me one purple, one blue, and then I can make a green. Create one dinosaur. The first time I do that, it's one worker. This is where you would use the DNA listed on the dinosaur recipe. The one on your starting board is any two basic. Um, you've got to have room, of course, for it. Um, if you wanted to do a second time, it's got a times two, so the second action would cost me two workers. The other thing that's on your board at the start of the game is the tool bench. You can either upgrade your security. You need to keep your security as high as the excitement level, which goes up based on the sorry, the threat level, which goes up based on how many dinosaurs you keep putting in your park. Um, the other thing you can do is build a paddock to make room for more dinosaurs. Um, dinosaur recipe tiles start off with a room for one, and if I wanted to upgrade to two, it would cost two. I'd put it on my board, and then I'd have room for another dinosaur, which also means another visitor will fit in that amusement. The other thing you can do is, of course, get money. The first worker you put on there gets you $3, second worker gets you $2, third worker gets you $1. So you could simply get $6 by putting all your workers there. This board is going to change as you buy lab upgrades. The first two would go there, and then if I wanted any more, I'm either covering up the existing ones or a previously placed ones. I love the fact that you can customize your own worker placement spots based on your strategy. One of my favorite things about the game. After we're done phase three, and by the way, everyone does this your worker phase at the same time, so it flows really quickly. And then finally, you've got the park phase. Depending on what your excitement level is, um, each dinosaur will have a number in a black triangle. Every time you add a dinosaur of that type, you're going to raise the excitement level. A dinosaur will also have um, a dot. That's the threat. So every dot that's added per dinosaur, if I put a another dinosaur here with one threat, I would move my threat. And these are tracked throughout the game. There's a reason for that. It's also worth mentioning that when you claim a dice here, there's uh, threat levels on each of the dice. The highest unclaimed dice at the end of phase one would get placed here. And for that round, the threat will increase by the amount that's on that dice. So we're into the park phase. We've got this bag of visitors. There's uh, 70 regular visitors, these gold guys, and 10 hoodlums in there. I have the worst luck with grabbing hoodlums. So you're going to reach into the bag and grab one for every excitement level of your park. So let's say my excitement level six. One, two, three, four, five. Usually the first couple of turns, you know, your excitement's only one or two. Now they're going to line up outside your park. Who Hooligans... These little rascals don't pay to come into your park. So they're the first one in, they're going to occupy a slot. And then your regular paying customers would fill in, in would fill in any extra slots. Say I had this here, I can fit two guys there. And then these guys can't fit into my park because I haven't built enough, so they're stuck waiting outside. Everyone's done their park phase, they're going to collect one dollar for everybody that went into their park. These guys in line are not going to give you any money. Before you claim victory points in the um, park phase here, depending on what your threat is, visitors are going to get eaten. So if I had uh, one threat or two threat, one security, say I had another dino in here, for this turn my threat is going to be three higher based on the dice that's left. So I've got a difference of three, which means three guys are going to get eaten from the park, and hooligans are always the last to go. So these guys would get eaten. I'm going to lose one victory point for every guy eaten. And then they're not going to be able to give me victory points or money because they got eaten. And then you can claim a victory point for every guy in there. Although these little rascal hooligans will not give you victory points or money. They jump the line and don't pay. There's an exception to this. The food places that sell um, food places you put in your, your park will give you the option of a victory point or two dollars for that guy. Once phase four is done, this first market row gets discarded. Everything moves up. The bottom row gets filled in and then anything else gets filled in. If any of these dinosaur recipes were bought, they're going to 
Uh, a new one's gonna get flipped up. Everybody takes back their workers and scientists. Um, whoever's in last place would go first in turn order for the next round. And the game will keep going until the game objectives are accomplished. So, speaking of that, there's three decks here. We've got a short game, a medium game, and a long game. You're gonna flip up the number of players plus one. So these will be out, and these set um, the end game timer basically. So once two of these are grabbed, then that is gonna be the last round of the game. And a player would put their little things on to show they've uh, achieved that. At the end of the round, that objective is now locked, and in future game rounds, other players cannot claim it. Of course, one person can get the objective at the beginning of the round, and someone else can get it at the end. It's also possible to claim the third one, because um, once two are gone, it just means that it's going to be the last round. It doesn't mean that other players cannot grab uh, more objectives. So your end game's always going to be different. There's always going to be like, uh, for example, earn seven victory points from dinosaur exhibits in a single round. Have nine dinosaurs in your park, or fill all but four zones of your board. Once two of those are done, that's going to be the end of the game. And these objectives are set around a medium game. Because it'll take maybe, maybe they got the medium game at uh, 45 minutes to an hour, say. So it usually takes about 45 minutes to an hour before people have their engines built efficient enough to start achieving these things. The other thing is a deck of plot twists. I'm going to use two of these every game. These are going to be little different rules that happen at the end of every round. Um, plot twist, here we go. Each time a DNA dice is claimed, a player is also going to grab $2 from the bank. Each player may increase cold storage limits by one for a single DNA type at the end of each round. Now these things are all like change uh, how the game is played. Um, each player may hire an additional specialist. Add two, and eight, two DNA dice to the dice pool in a four player game. Add one. So that'll increase the amount of dice that are available. And there's a bunch of different ones of these plot twists. You don't absolutely have to play with Plot Twist either, you can just choose not to. At the end of the game, once uh, the all but one objective have been taken, that signals the end of the, end of the round, everybody's going to score points based on the number of stars on their ride. In the case of the dinosaur exhibits, it's going to be whatever the star per dinosaur, uh, to a max of four, so like the... Uh, the large carnivores are worth seven points a dinosaur, so they can be worth big points. All of your money, every five coins you have, is worth a point. And then whatever you scored on the objectives here. So, whether it's a long, medium, or short game, all the objectives are worth the same amount of points, six, seven, or eight. Whoever has the highest points is the winner. Alright, so, what do I think of Dinosaur Island? Well, first of all, I love the variability in this game, the variety. You've got a stack of different upgrades, so you can customize your own worker placement board. I really, really like that, and I like how you can replace old ones. I even like how you have the freedom to cover up the space that gives you money, which seems pretty important. The plot twist. I love using the plot twist. I like having different advantages or disadvantages that happen every round. It changes the way you play the game. I like the objective cards. Every game is going to have different end game objectives. You're going to find ones you might like better than others, and you can feel free to pick and choose the ones you want to use. I like that they give you the option for a small game, medium game, and a long game. I think that's brilliant. I find the short game is great for teaching someone, but I can't see myself wanting to play the short game. I think the medium game is a great play length. That's kind of the sweet spot. And I'm more than happy to play a long game as well because I like the game a lot. The longer the game you play, the bigger and badder your part gets. The graphic design, the colors that they use, now, I think this can be a very polarizing look. Anything that uses oranges and blues and neons is going to be polarizing. But I dig it a lot. I like the look of this game. I like the uh, the 90s pop art 
look to it. I like the amber dice, which, you know, throw back to Jurassic Park. In fact, the person that goes first, the player who most recently extracted DNA from a mosquito trapped in amber will be the first player. If no player has successfully accomplished that task, the player who most recently visited a theme park will be the first player. I think the game plays great at two, plays good at three, and it plays good at four. That's slick, and a big reason for that is because the the worker and the park phase, uh, well I guess the park phase is technically not simultaneous, but because um, you, you gotta pass the bag around. But I mean, everybody's doing their own worker actions at the same time, so the game rounds really fly. You're not like waiting for everyone to finish. When you first teach someone the game, though, the first two, three turns, I find it's good just to go in order with your workers so they um, get the gist of how things go. The specialist. I love all the different types of specialists. It's a pretty good sized deck of different specialists. You can get like a security guard that'll let you grab up the three hooligans and throw them back into the bag and redraw. Um, there's just a lot of cool things that shake up the game and again it goes to that customization that I really like. So the specialists are just an awesome little addition. But uh, back to my thoughts here. So the specialists are great um, with the variety of the specialists, the lab upgrades, and to a lesser extent the amusement park. I mean uh, these don't have a lot of variety. You got a food place, you've got uh, merchandise which is just straight up points at the end of the game and then you've got like rides which lets you fit uh, up a bunch of people on it so something like this that lets you fit three visitors is pretty nice but there's not a ton of um, variability in the attractions but that's okay it there doesn't need to be so the pros are there's so much to love about this game if if it's not obvious by now I am I adore this game I'm in love with it it's a great fun worker placement game with an awesome theme Running your own dinosaur park? That's that's the coolest thing. All right, so let's let's turn things around and look at the negatives, okay? So um, the biggest one for me is the first player turn order. Whoever is in last always goes first player. I just don't like that in uh, this game. You can purposely let the uh, keep your security down so that dinosaurs eat the people, so that you lose points, so that you can go first in turn order. The reason for that is going first is really a powerful ability, and the objectives that you score at the end of the game don't count to your victory points until the end of the game. So they're banked for later, so it's, um, it's a common thing for people to purposely keep themselves in last, Meanwhile, they're building their engine just to pull through at the end. So I'm kind of torn as to whether I don't like the first player rule and having to think differently about it, having to purposely maybe tank my points because I want to be first player, that I find is an interesting decision, but ultimately I still don't like it. I think there should be a strategic option to become the first player like most worker placement games um maybe like a, a blind bidding phase or something which maybe might make the game longer but it's the it's my only real nitpicky thing about this game i'm not a fan of the person last always being the first player does it ruin the game for me no not even close it doesn't bother me that much and some of the people i played with weren't put off by that at all another thing you can have a Tyrannosaurus Rex or a Brontosaurus, but in game terms, it doesn't matter. I mean, sure, the, the Tyrannosaurus is worth more points at the end of the game per dinosaur, but there's like, there's nothing that sets it apart other than, you know, more points, more threat, and more excitement. So what type of dinosaurs you, you grow doesn't really mean anything. All large carnivores are kind of in the same... Uh, ballpark for stats and medium car small carnivores and then herbivores and all the dinosaurs are the same meeple choice now i wish i got on the kickstarter and had brontosaurus meeples and trinosaurus meeples and all that um but i'm never going to get that and i'm not going to pay 320 dollars on ebay 
to the game with the metal coins and the different dino meeples. That was something that disappointed my wife too. She's like, ooh, I got a brontosaurus. Give me a brontosaurus meeple. Uh, sorry, baby. They're all these uh, pink triceratops. So that was a disappointing feature. The randomness of the visitors. Now, I have notoriously bad luck grabbing these purple hooligans and they can really, if you're exceptionally unlucky, they can throw off your game if you're always uh, pulling them. You can mitigate that by getting like a security guard that throws them out and um, um, you can get lab upgrades that will help you mitigate them as well. So yes, you can mitigate it, but still you should be aware of that level of randomness that can affect your game. So that's it, that's Dinosaur Island. Highly recommend it. I hear there is a Kickstarter expansion coming. It's an auto back for me. I hope they make the dinosaurs more meaningful of the different types. I hope they change the first player order and they hope that they give us a chance to get a more variability of dinosaur meeples. I'm tempted to get a 3D printer just so I can start making my own. And if anyone knows where I can buy dino meeples, please let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching everyone, I'm Jason Peacock, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.